and we're back. I told you you'd live through it. Guys, you have no idea how much this game means to me. As somebody who has always enjoyed YouTube poops, made them, grew up around them, and the people therein, seeing a game like this made by the exact people who used to make some of that content is a huge thing. Don't know what I'm talking about? Well, sit down, friend. I'm about to tell you about RZ. RZ The Jewel of Faramore is a passion project made by Seth Fulkerson, who I know better as Doppley. In the late 2000s, just like a lot of us guys around that time, he was making YouTube poops and memeing it up with the rest of us guys, enjoying the silliness and craptasticness that is the CDI Zelda games and their infamous cutscenes. Now, I already made a video about the CDI Zelda games, and in that video, I played the remastered versions of the games. Well, those versions were actually made by Doppley, and using what he learned about game development while making those, he decided to make his own passion project. A game completely inspired by those Zelda CDI games, giving the world a new game with all the charm, insanity, and aesthetic of those old games. Except this game was actually going to be good. And that's where a lot of people had doubts about this project. They thought it was going to be intentionally bad. Well, I'm here to tell you, friends, that this game is not bad. In fact, it's one of the most fun games I've played this year. Alan Wake, suck it. Baldur Gates, suck it. Power World, nah, you're cool, you're cool. RZ is the new shit in town. The game everyone should be playing, whether you're a fan of YouTube poops, CDI memes, or none of that, and just want a nice short and sweet retro style game with its own unique identity. The game starts off with an animation parodying the CDI intro for when you load a disc in and even goes as far as to mimic the 3D text that appears when you first boot up the Zelda CDI games. Then it gives us some prologue in the form of these hand-drawn artworks by legendary YouTube pooper and talented artist Gabuchan. This is really good stuff and looks like nothing else. Basically, Arzet and a bard named Dale banished an evil lord named Dimer into a book using a magic jewel called the Jewel of Faramore, and there was peace in the land and the Jewel of Faramore was broken into pieces and hidden throughout the land. But the evil Duke Nadelki, which is one letter away from being an anagram for Onklid, after being forced to scrub all the floors in Faramore, found the pieces and awakened Dimer. Dimer then gives the Jewel Shards to his minions, so Arzet has to defeat the minions to get the Jewel Shards back. And a lot of this is explained in the cutscenes that follow you starting the game. Check this shit out, man. This is straight out of Zelda CDI. I mean, they got the look absolutely perfect. Your Majesty, our worst fears have come true. Dimer and his minions have returned. That's impossible. What about the Jewel of Faramore? Oh, our vigilance waned. The Jewel Shards are with the enemy. Ah, easy peasy. We just gotta get the jewel back together and trap him in that old book, right? Ugh, if only a dark fog has filled the land. It prevents our approach. Your eyes cannot see daylight out there. What about the sacred beacons? They weakened Dimer before. I'm afraid that due to complacency, they've been left unlit. Hmm. Oh well. What can we do? Well, as you know, only a member of the royal family can rekindle the beacons. I'm ready. Well, I'm not. I like this guy Dale. He's like a mixture of CDI Link and TV show Link as far as personality. I keep waiting on him to do that animation where Link covers his face. Another issue. My scouts report sightings of dark tapestries that impede critical paths. Oh, not a problem. My ancestors hid sacred candles throughout the kingdom that can burn these tapestries. That settles it then. Another fun adventure for me to stay out of. Where must I go? I place teleportation scrolls throughout the kingdom that you may use, so long as the dark fog around them has been dispelled. I'll be leaving then. Good luck! Get back before dinner! Be safe, my daughter. Did you get all that? No? Too bad, this is RZ the Jewel of Faramore. Now there's two difficulties to start off with. In normal, you don't get health pickups. I don't know how hard this game's gonna be, so I'll save normal for a second run. Before you can play the game, you have to play what I think is the part that's gonna have most of the game journalists stomped, the tutorial. Wanna defeat Dimer? Let's get started. 
Move left or right to start running. Moving while crouching lets you duck walk. This old trick gets you into tight spaces. As you no doubt have noticed, it's narrated by CDI Link himself, Jeffrey Rath. And the intro story is narrated by Bonnie Jean Wilbur, the voice actress of Zelda. Cool, huh? I am very happy that you can duck walk in this game. I could try duck walking if my back wasn't made of cheese. One thing I should say about the tutorial level is it has some really good music. Hell, this whole game has really great music. The music was made by a Grammy award-winning music composer named Button Masher. I checked out his YouTube channel, and man, he's got some really great remixes on his channel. And what the hell? He's got less subscribers than I do. That's not fair. Y'all go to sub to him if y'all want to hear some good games game music. Help the guy out. So what we have here is a side-scrolling Metroidvania type game. The more you play, the more you'll unlock new paths and areas. There'll be places you can't get to, but if you come back later when you get a specific item, you can open up that path. So we're in Duridan Forest, the first level, and this level does a good job of giving you an idea of what you're in for. It doesn't try to throw everything at you too early, especially since you just started. And can we take a moment to admire these hand-painted backgrounds? Holy Moses, is this impressive. The last time I saw a detail like this in a side-scroller was Dust in Elysian Tale. I told Dopley that I imagined on something like this, the artist and the level designer has to work very closely together. And Dopley gave me some insight on how the levels were made and showed me some sketches that were used to make the levels. Here's what he said. Thankfully, I had an artistic vision for how a level should work in addition to designing it as a level because I hand-drew every single map in the game before handing it off to an artist to paint. I started by drawing every single level on graph paper first. I'd choose a good shape or something interesting and go from there. Then I'd gray box and game maker the best I could, transferring things over and making it work. After I prototyped and tested the stage a lot, especially with my collaborator John Linneman, I'd draw a sketch of the gray box. I'd write comments on it to direct the painters. Finally, this sketch was handed off to a painter, or in this case of Duridan, was collaborated on by several painters. Now you have the beautiful result which I would work on making it work in-engine as well as add parallax into the game. Ron Dunleve worked on the main menu map, which went in a similar process, as well as another stage which maybe you can speculate on. Now the first level, Duridan Forest, is actually my favorite because there's a particular character you meet in this level that I got confirmation from people who worked on this game that this character is in fact based on me! Look, there he is! Oh my god, he does look like me! Or like a non-copyright version of me. Like if Pal World made a rip off of me, that's what I would look like. Let's check him out. Oh great, they finally sent someone to kill me. Alright, make it snappy. I'm sure you got places to go. Other people to kill. Uh, no. Who would do that? Oh, my name is Cypress. I want to move into town, but the mayor thinks I'm a monster man. I don't think that. Really? You don't think I'm a disgusting, rabid nut? You think you could convince the mayor to let me move in then, and stop thinking I'm the wolf among us? If you thought of this instead of this, we can be friends. You know, Doppley, you could have asked me to voice act this character. I would have done it for free. I'm the radio preacher and stay out of the house, and I did that for free. Although they told me they were gonna pay me and they didn't, but that's another story. I steadily get messages from people asking me if I did voices on this game, and I didn't. Eh, maybe the sequel. So the game gives us objectives we have to complete while we're working on the main story, and some of these objectives will give us key items or useful items to use in the game. Our first order of business in this level is activating the beacon. Every beacon you activate opens up new levels and also sends you back to the castle for another cutscene. Okay, if I don't mention this, somebody will. The cutscene that happens after the first beacon was made using rotoscoped 3D models. And you can really tell. Okay, how do I put this? Different animators worked on different cutscenes, so like the quality of the cutscenes kind of differs between each animator. So this stands out as being drastically different from the rest of the cutscenes. But I hate to be Mr. I'm different than everybody, but I don't have a problem with it. People are saying it's shit, but the thing is, it's supposed to be shit. You're complaining about something doing what it's supposed to do. That's like if I say, fuck you, PC. Fuck you and your stupid ray tracing and your 60 FPS. Fuck you, car, for taking me from A to B. Think you're so high and mighty. Fuck you, toilet. You know what? You're full of shit.
What's supposed to be? That's where shit goes. Piss, shit, and Elden Ring. That's what belongs in a toilet. That's why I call it Toilet Ring. Now, as you play the game, you'll find walls that you can't get past. There's red ones, blue ones, purple ones, faux medium aquamarine ones. And to destroy them, you need a gun. And I do mean a gun. It's just straight up a fucking gun. And the gun is powered by the souls of your fallen enemies. That is metal as fuck. Now, despite the gun being extremely useful and making the game a little easier, it's actually possible to finish the entire game without even getting the gun. You even get an achievement for it called Your sword is enough. Remember how the CDI games had dark areas that you couldn't see through and you needed a lamp to get through them? Well, they have that in this too. But it is actually possible to go through these areas without the lamp. It's just very hard to do. I gotta say, the level design on this game is pretty damn great. You never do feel like you don't know where the fuck you're going, or don't ever feel like you don't know where the fuck you're supposed to go, because the game does kinda hold your hand and do some go here, you're dumb fuck kinda thing, but not too much. The times that it doesn't do that, it's pretty easy for you to figure out where you're supposed to go, even if you don't have that great of a memory. One small little detail I really like is when you get a new item that you've never used before, or a new weapon or something like that, like that, the level you get it in kind of has something really close to it where you can use it and figure out how it works. I like that in level design. Like, you can instantly start jumping up and down on that new bad dragon. The game's also got bonus levels, some of which are inspired by Hotel Mario, as you can see right here. So, if you wanted Hotel Mario representation, here it is. There's a town you can come to at any point in the game and talk to the local townsfolk, or get some lamp oil rope and bobs from the shopkeeper. Whoa, this isn't a charity friend. Pay with something, will ya? You'll pay one way or the other. He's not as jolly as Morshu. He's definitely got his own thing going on. Now, I would show more of the cutscenes in town, but I think you should experience them for yourself. So much heart and soul went into every single one of these cutscenes that watching them is half the fun of this game. So showing too much of them would spoil the game. But trust me when I say every single one is wonderful. Also, if you look around town enough, you can find a library which has some particular characters in there that pay tribute to some other animation magic games. I'll tell you about them one day. The last thing I should mention about the cutscenes is that the voice cast is a who's who of gaming YouTubers. You've got fucking Vinny Vine Sauce, My Life in Gaming, Modern Vintage Gamer, they're all here. Half the fun is trying to figure out which one of these guys is who. The only person that's not here is, uh, Game Dude. Who's with me? Who wants Game Dude back? Now, after you collect enough candles, you can start fighting bosses. And the bosses are pretty damn fun to fight. And some can be challenging, but not balls hard or anything like that. The only hard balls in this game are, uh... I got nothing for that, sorry. It's hard to make jokes when I'm playing a game that's actually good. Yo, we got a Halloween-themed level going on here. This looks like the first level of Gex. Say Gex! As you get further on down in the game, you start getting elemental enemies that can only be killed with a certain shot from the gun since you have different color bullets. And you get into more deep dark caverns, so you better make sure you bought a bunch of lamp oil. Unless you want to run around like a chicken with your head cut off. Did you know a chicken once lived 18 months with its head cut off? Look it up! That's the kind of shit bored Googling gives you. Now when you get down that last stretch of the game, you get your sword powered up and your gun powered up, and now your gun can defeat any wall regardless of color with the same ammo. It don't discriminate. The final boss can be a hell of a fight because he throws the book at you, and he's got two stages. First he just throws books at you, and then he throws books at different heights. Luckily, early in the game, you pick up a shield, so you better use it to block yourself. You do the second stage, and then you do a little bit more platforming, and you hit him one time with a sword, and it's all over. And I'm not gonna show you the last cutscene, because you need to see it for yourself. Now get out there, get on Steam, go buy this game, and have a lot of fucking fun. This is a good-ass game. There's nothing bad about it. I ain't got a bad thing to say about it. It's one of the best games I've ever played for 2024.
It helps that I'm both a sucker for platformers and Metroidvanias and just retro style games in general. It feels like this game was made for me. Especially since it was made by YouTube poopers, is a love letter to Zelda CDI and animation magic games, and I feel that it will be just as beloved by YouTube poopers and memers alike for the silly cutscenes and the outrageous art style and everything. Look, people are already making YouTube poops of it. If you search RZ YouTube poop in the YouTube search engine, there's tons of them already. People are already latching onto this. This game may have just revived YouTube poop as a medium. And you could bet your bottom dollar, if I was still doing YouTube poop news, I would be going ape shit over this. And I would still be an unlikable asshole. But that's behind me, so. RZ the Jewel of Faramore, 10 out of fucking 10, baby. The highest score I can give this fucking game. I would give it 11 if I could. Fuck it, it's my video, 11. I hope it sells millions, and I hope there will be a sequel, and another sequel, and so on. And please, let me be in it. Maybe, perhaps, please. I'll voice anything. I don't care if I'm a fucking flea that farts or some shit. I'll fart till my ass farts off. Farts off, falls off. Oh my God. Well, that's it. That's the video, everybody. RZ the Jewel of Faramore. Awesome fucking game. What more do I have to say? Other than I am a piece of shit YouTuber that takes way too long to put out content. But hey, I promised y'all an RZ video. Here it is. Well, that's it out of me. My name's Stuart K. Riley. If you've never heard of me, I'm Stuart K. Riley. See you later.